In other words, we're partakers of God's Spirit because the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts. And uh, as a result of that, you know, we have precious promises and um, the great things that God has for us because of uh, that we've escaped the corruption that is in this world through lusts. But then, of course, he talked about um, these things, and he really put an emphasis on these things that we add to our faith, virtue, and we really work and we orchestrate these things together, virtue and knowledge and self-control or perseverance or um, and the, uh, uh, perseverance, um, godliness, and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, love, and these, you know, these things that need to be added to our life. And if we're constantly working on these things and allowing the Holy Spirit, the divine nature, to control our lives, then we're not going to be, uh, as he, and I love that passage, where he says uh, in, if, uh, in verse 8, for if these things are yours or are in you and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For one thing, you won't doubt your salvation. Another thing is you are walking with the Lord and growing in him. But uh, but he that lacks these things is short-sighted, the word myopic. And that's one of those things where, you know, you see people that are not growing in the Lord. Um, I You can't make the judgment as whether they're saved or unsaved, sometimes because Christians can fall into some of the most sordid sins at times. Um, but... Uh, Notice that the Bible doesn't give a Christian or a person who is walking in sin a great comfort or assurance of salvation. Now, when I say assurance of salvation, I really challenge a person if they're living in sin, if they're saved, because, you know, there again, if they're saved, there's going to be conviction there. For whom the Lord loves, he, he chastens, he chastises. And so again, we see that uh, the Holy Spirit works in our lives because we are part of the divine nature. Now does, but there again, I, I know in my own personal life, I can get so cold at times that I don't feel the Holy Spirit. So, you know, uh, I don't have to feel saved at 8.30 in the morning, uh, you know, or whatever. Right? Like if uh, faith was feelings, like some one preacher I heard say, uh, then I wouldn't be saved until about 10 o'clock because I'm not really going until about 10 o'clock. But there again, God doesn't give, oh, I can go, I can be saved and just live the way I want to. No, if you're saved, you've got the divine nature working in you, and there's a, a battle between the flesh and the spirit. And if Paul had that battle, and he says, those things which I would, I do not, and those things which I would not, that I do, the old wretched man that I am, uh, the Lord Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, not was chief, and so if the Apostle Paul has problems with those problems, with those things, then guess what? I do too, and you do too. And, but at the same time, you know, so we can't be the judge as far as a person's salvation when they uh, walk outside the will of the Lord. But we can definitely, you know, we can challenge them as to their spirituality and so forth because they will be myopic, which means uh, short-sighted there or nearsighted or blind. Um, and they cannot see uh, that they, they had forgotten that they were cleansed from their old sins. So these are th things that we must realize. And then he goes and he talks about these things and these things, for if these things be in you. And he talks about it, he says, I, I want to keep putting you in remembrance of these things. Now in chapter 2 then, we see that uh, he is going to spend a whole chapter on warnings. Now, Peter has been along or long enough to know um, how the, the devil can deceive. We saw last week Simon the sorcerer, and uh, you know just how the devil is always looking for ways of of getting into the church and getting into our hearts and deceiving us. And um, Paul later on with the Ephesians, he said you're going to have wolves come in, and he's talking one he, the, uh, the church of Ephesus was. Paul's probably magnum opus is probably his greatest work as far as getting it started and so forth. And yet he said there's going to be all kinds of things that you're going to, to discern. And so, and now that Peter is within days of probably his crucifixion, we see that he is saying, uh, of course, he, uh, the, the, we end the chapter of chapter four or chapter one, excuse me, with the fact that no prophecy 
or no uh, of scripture, no scripture uh, is of any private interpretation. Now you can't interpret it. Boy, do we have some politicians interpreting scripture today? I mean, what was that? Uh, Governor of California was interpreting scripture to say that Jesus endorsed uh, abortion or whatever this past week. Or I mean, all kinds of crazy things that are out there. Um, and so we see that, uh, no, you just can't pull a verse out of scripture and say, this is what Jesus said. No, terp- uh, scripture interprets itself. And that's the reason that we really uh, preach um, expositional messages here because we want to dig as deep down into there as possible and say this is what the Bible says and not what man says and uh, when it's uh, and you have seen that whenever I say there's differences of opinion of good men will say that but uh, um, but uh, scripture is not to be interpreted that where we can justify sin or justify what we're doing we go to scripture to ask God what he wants us to do. And so it's no prophet that he says, but uh, holy men of old spoke as they were moved, inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit. Now in chapter two, we see, but, and there's that the great conjunction again. And he says, but there will be false prophets among the people, even as there were false prophets among you. So they're always going to be there. They're always going to be people trying to deceive, people that uh, have their own private interpretation or whatever else. But he says, but there's false prophets uh, among the people, even as uh, were false teachers among you, who secretly, uh, notice their characteristics, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. I mean, they will... That's why I tell you, if somebody comes in here and they start giving out literature that I haven't endorsed, you know, give it to me. Let me see it because we've got to stop that kind of thing. Uh, You'll have people that come in and uh, unfortunately I didn't realize it for unfortunately too long. But I had um, the person that was really much more Pentecostal here than than we preach. And so um, he was discouraging some people and I had a visitor one time said you know you got two different you got a you got something going on in that church I said no I don't I didn't see it at the time but there again you're always looking for it and so but there again I don't say okay Dominic and I disagree on certain things so you know we gotta I ought to watch out for Dominic you know he's no we don't do that you know Uh, if I have a disagreement with Dominic I'll go to him and we'll talk about it or whatever and so uh, we see that uh, uh, that we want to keep a positive message, and yet we got to, you know, the Bible says be circumspect. That means you're walk, looking around. You're as wise as an old serpent, but as harmless as a dove. I mean, a snake is pretty wise, isn't he? He just it stands there, and he cannot run to pray, but he can just move that head, and that uh, he'll get closer and closer till he gets it. Well, we're not a snake in the grass. But if we got to, sometimes we have to out snake the devil, I guess, or out fox the devil or whatever else. And know that he's called, you know, the devil and his emissaries are called snakes and you know, foxes and all kinds of deceptive cre- creatures in the Bible. And so here we see that uh, he is saying that they're going to come along. But I hope, and like someone uh, said, like uh, the old illustration, is whenever they try to teach you about counterfeits, uh, they don't teach you to look for the counter. They don't show you unless, of course, after you've already learned. They'll say, be what? But, they, but whenever they're initially teaching you about counterfeit money, they want to get you so involved in exactly what real money looks at, like that whenever something is wrong, you might not spot it immediately, but you know something's wrong. And I love it when people come to me and say, Pastor, I listened to this person and I couldn't understand what was going on. But, uh, but it bothered me. I, uh, there was a guy named Garner Ted Armstrong when I was in the service. And um, he was very smooth. He was a worldwide church of God. It was uh, a, a false cult. It's, it's still out there, but not as prominent. They don't have the golden voice. Uh, Garner, let's see, his father was Herbert W., then him. They were two very um, 
I mean, you listen, their, their voices just would melt you. I mean, just, just very good voices on the radio. But um, I was listening to him one time, and uh, I think he sounds good about the Lord and all that, but there's something wrong, and I can't place it. And I went home and talked to my pastor, and he said, you know, I can't tell you not to listen to him because I, he knew, knows me that, you know, okay, if I'm not, uh, why shouldn't I listen to him? So was, well, but if you're going to listen to him, uh, know that he's not, he's, gonna, he's got a morbid sense of hell. He doesn't believe there's hell. And really, he doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And you're going to, and he, he showed me a couple of things, and it wasn't, I mean, the next time I listened, and then later on, I even heard him a scoff at anybody who believed in what hell was about. And, you know, so there again, there's a lot of people out there that can, they, they sound smooth. Uh, and, but now I like, and that's why people, now some of you are too young to remember this, but uh, a good old Jimmy Swaggart and good old uh, uh, Tammy and, uh, let's see, what was the, Jim and Tammy Baker? Uh, I mean, th those are, uh, it was so easy for me to spot them as faults, but it was so hard for my people the, uh, down in Mobile, Alabama to, to get that until it, but uh, you just thought, don't listen to them. But it wasn't long before my people, the more you teach them, the more, oh, I see that, Pastor, I didn't see that before. Or, or, or you know, so, but you, it's very difficult to say, don't listen to this person. Because all of a sudden, why is the preacher telling me not to do that? Because that's just like, you know, you know, you know it's almost like forbidden fruit. So you have to be very careful, even as a pastor, to, if you're going to name names, you better be ready with all, I mean, so you've got to be careful with, because if you get somebody mad at you, they're not going to listen to you anyway. And so, uh, or if, you, if you're, I remember one lady, um, I mentioned some, and I just mentioned a name, and she had just started coming uh, her um, to church there, but I mentioned the name, and the people in backer said, "Pastor, you better be careful. You gotta go. You want to talk to this lady, because whenever you mention that name, I could." Act, he, he said, "Literally, you can see the hairs on the back of her neck almost stand, and he, and he, and he said you could just see her turn, because." And come to find out, that was one of her favorite people. And, but fortunately, I was able to smooth it over and without compromise. And she stayed. In fact, I preached her funeral later on. But, you know, it's one of those things where you got to be very careful. If you're going to, like someone said, if you're going to skin the sheep, then don't leave them bleeding in the aisles. you got to make sure that you, you bring them. A, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so, yeah, your sins are a scarlet. Let me show you how, but uh, let's reason about it till you get to the point where you see what I see. And so, uh, again, uh, this is what you see with this old man now talking to this younger generation. And he says um, in verse 2, and many will follow their destructive ways. Uh, unfortunately, that's true, because of whom the way of truth was not, was, will be blasphemed uh, by their covetous. They uh, exploit you. They use deceptive words. Uh, and uh, with a long time, their judgment has not been uh, idle, and their destruction uh, does not slumber. I mean, uh, you could tell a man by his fruits, and uh, how sad it is to see um, the destructiveness of people like uh, the people I've just mentioned and others, and we can go through, and, and it doesn't do a whole lot of good right now to go through names today, false teachers on t on. The, a radio or television there's I mean there's some good ones and but uh, for every good one out there it seems like there's three bad ones so but at the same time uh, as Christians I hope that we learn the word well enough that when we hear error we spot it and that's my goal here is that I can't be with you uh, every time you listen turn on the car radio I can't be with you but the Holy Spirit can and so we want to teach truth and what this is what Paul, what uh, Peter is saying, is uh, I'm st this old tent is going to fold up pretty soon, as he said in chapter one, and I'm not going to be here. I'm worried about you, and so these things have got to be taught to you. Now he now he's going to give some illustrations here, in verse uh, four, he says, "For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast down, uh, uh, cast them down to hell, and delivered them." 
in chains and darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world who saved, uh, but saved Noah. And how many people? Eight. Okay, uh, who are the eight? And yes, so, so, no, daughters-in-law. Okay, so you have Mrs. Noah and Mrs. Shem and Mrs. Ham and Mrs. J Japheth. Uh, it's interesting how that uh, they were older and probably at least 100 years old or more, when, and they hadn't had any kids yet. Well, and yet it's kind of a, can you imagine having to have a whole flock of kids and nursery and everything else on that ark? So the Lord uh, knew how to control all that. Uh, but um, then again, so he said, but, but first of all, if Satan can deceive a third of the angels, that's scary, isn't it? And we know there's millions of angels. That's what the Revelation 5 tells us, 4 and 5 tells us that there's millions of angels. So he deceived millions of angels. Now, the one thing we must realize is that in every age, whether it's before Noah or after Noah, uh, during the tribulation, after the tribulation, in the millennium, where men are going to be born without the curse of sin, uh, wherever man is born, God always gives a choice. And even with his angels, he had to give them a choice as to whether to follow him or not. And that is that will be true. Uh, we're going to praise the Lord in the, the tribulation. We know that the world is going to be under uh, all kinds of judgment. And yet we see the only time in Scripture that we see angels preaching to the world, salvation, you know, fear God. So it's interesting how that is. God will always give man a choice and give his created beings a choice. And he gave the angels a choice. And uh, that's why blindness is so interesting to me. Because if I was the devil... You know, Paul Harvey, remember Paul Harvey, if I was the devil, remember that the great uh, speech he gave? But if I was the devil, uh, and I'd been beaten so many times by the Lord, and if I'd seen the resurrection, as Paul says, um, you know, if uh, the devil knew that the Lord would be raised from the dead, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory. If I had seen all the things that God had done and smacked him down over, I think I'd come to the point where I'd say, you know, if I can't beat him, let's join him. But it's interesting how that God, uh, if a person is going to be blind, God lets them be blind. Satan still thinks he's going to win. Isn't it interesting that that person out there that is blind to God, until they, until they were blind, but now they see, until they, until they surrender their hearts to God, they can't see. I was uh, do, uh, invited a guy that's got all kinds of problems in his life, and I said, hey, listen, I'd love for you to come out with me uh, to the revival meetings this weekend. He said, probably not. I mean, the, the one, play, you know, anything to get, you know, to, but and he's just, his life is just spiraling down. And the one thing that could help him is the things he's rejecting. And it's so interesting, but that's why, because uh, as that old slave driver himself said, I was blind, but now I see John Newton until the Lord opens our eyes. And that's what we got to pray for is, is whenever someone is in, uh, even you're, and um, you know, a man that's now down in Missouri, he was with us, one of our main men, but they got off into, um, into a false cult. And I still pray for him. Lord, you've got to open his eyes because the more I talk to him, the more that he just doesn't see. Well, uh, here we see that uh, that that's going to happen and until God opens the eyes. And so it's the preaching of the word and the cross. It's to them that perish foolishness, but to us it's the power. It's the one thing that changes. My reasoning, my great intellect, my great cultural background. Uh, we think all those things are going to say, when people know it's the Holy Spirit that works in the heart of person that will save their souls and change their lives and allow them to see. And so we see that uh, the people before Noah, and uh, you know, if you look back on those timelines, oh, Adam lived, he was just within a few hundred years of Noah. And then, you know, you look at all those years that they lived, 900 years and so forth, there were a lot of people on earth and they heard the gospel over and over again 
Um, we know that Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So God never left himself without a witness uh, to those people. And so we see that Noah uh, was one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. I like that. You didn't know that Noah was a preacher, did you? But uh, he was a preacher of righteousness, uh, bringing in the flood. Remember God gave him, he preached for 120 years at least. Remember God gave him 120 years to repent? Boy, what a ministry that'd be, a 120-year ministry. But uh, we see, and he, uh, but he, uh, he was a preacher of right, bringing in the flood on the world uh, of the ungodly and turning the cities, now here's another example, of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Folks, that's what scares me about America today is we are openly, and government is openly promoting the things that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah over. And so uh, someone has said, if God doesn't judge us, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. So notice, oh, Peter's not pulling any punches, is he? He's saying, this is what happens to people that turn away from God. And so he says, uh, and never, remember, this is his swan song. And this is the last time he gets to talk to these people. He talks about his love for them and everything, but he says, fellas, you got to listen. I mean, we're talking about as Moses. Hey, I'm talking life and death, folks, here. This is something that is deadly serious. And so he is saying, um, uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and ashes and condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So is Sodom and Gomorrah an example to us today? Yes. Yes, and that's what, uh, that's what uh, Brother Chris Miller and everybody's hoping is that, uh, you know, there's at least 10 of us out there. Yeah, but it's a little bit bigger than uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But there again, hey, listen, there's no guarantee. But the thing about it is there's no guarantee. What we got to do is say, hey, folks, if you're in sin, there's no, you know, you, you are responsible for your actions, but you are not, but you have no control over the consequences of your actions. And we got to remember that. Uh, God is the one that brings on the consequences. And um, remember um, Saul? Saul kept thinking, you know, uh, he was condemned, and yet he kept thinking that he could outfox God. He was even going to kill the man that was obviously going to be his, his uh, successor. Uh, and Solomon did the same thing. God said, hey, the, the kingdom's going to be ripped from you. And Solomon did everything to do to keep it from happening. And time and time again, you see that, hey, listen, when you sin, uh, God's consequences are there. And you're not. Now, it doesn't mean you lay down and uh, the best thing Solomon or Saul could have done is say, oh, Lord, forgive me for my sin. And Lord, I accept whatever punishment. David did that, didn't he? You know, David <laughs> fell into horrible sin, but God, in spite of the fact that he was a murderer and an adulterer and everything else, God still spared him. Now, that's a big difference between him and Saul. Remember Saul? Uh, Saul, uh, uh, yeah, but Samuel, yeah, but Samuel said to him, uh, uh, Saul, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Now, what that means is you're moving yourself outside of God's tent and you're putting yourself open to the devil. And remember what we talked, we stressed that over and over again in the book of Psalms, tabernacle, tent. I want to dwell there because if you're in a Mideastern tent, the person who has invited you into that tent is responsible for your safety and welfare. And so if you're in God's tent, you're in pretty good shape. But if you remove yourself, rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, then you're open to anything that Satan has for you. And so, where, and that, that's always fascinating to me as you read about Saul. So Saul's sin is the, uh, or rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Where did Saul visit the last night of his life? <laughs> the witch of Endor. It's so amazing. I just loved the, the, that timeline with Saul. And he kept trying to kill David, you know, because David was, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, but yet uh, we see that that was exact. And you look at today, uh, you know, the, the, the and the, they talk about more, my, maybe, maybe I should get some of these, once I get the, my Jumbotron back up, with, uh, with the, but we'll maybe get some of these, um, th these clippings I'm seeing on rate, but you know, the, one of the, the, the biggest rise of anything that's going on in America today as far as religion? 
witchcraft. It's really, it's amazing all this stuff. I, I uh, when I uh, did some substitute teaching, these kids would come to school with these black thing and all this kind of stuff on. It's just amazing how that is. Uh, you know, but there again, whenever we turn away from the Lord, Satan's going to fill it. And so again, we see here that, uh, okay, look at these examples, Sodom and Gomorrah. Then after he says they delivered ungodly, uh, and, deli- and then he, and this is the one that I can't understand. If there's one person in scripture that I just detest more than just, well, just about as much as anybody else is Lot. You know, he, he says to us, and he delivered righteous Lot. Oh, righteous Lot. I mean, do you realize what Lot did? Yep. Sodom and Gomorrah. Then he lost his wife. And then what he did to his, I mean, I didn't, I mean, when I had, I, had, I knew the Lord was going to give me three boys. And I praise the Lord for my three boys. But he threw a little girl in there too. And boy, that was, boy, that, she's, she called me last night. We talked, that's one reason I didn't get the bulletin done last night was I talked to her for two hours. And so by the time I said, I got to go home. But, uh, uh, you know, but once I had a daughter, I, I detested a lot more. I mean, just to think how that he treated his daughter. And, you know, that mob out there, hey, listen, I'll throw you my daughters. <laughs> what? Amen. And then well, we won't even get into what he did later on. But, you know, just how horrible that man was. And God says he was righteous. That's why as a pastor, I do give a person the benefit of the doubt. La- pastor, I was saved so many years ago, okay? What you've been doing since then? And their lives are like lots, you know? I, I'm not going to say they're not saved. And all I can do is give them hope. Hope for America, you know, that God can bring them out of their sin. That's, if we don't have hope, we don't have anything. And so faith, hope, and love. And so, but hey, listen, but your hope is, right? My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let's see. Boy, I'm messing up my song. I, what? Jesus, blood, and righteousness. I, uh, what I was wanting to say was Schofield's notes and references, but no, I won't say. But, you know, <laughs> no, uh, uh, but that's why when you start singing those songs and, and, make, and, and you put the other words in them, then all of a sudden you have trouble remembering what the real words were. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that um, there again, you know, Jesus, blood, and righteousness. You know, there again. Yeah. Yeah, but he also knew that, but he also knew that, uh, that, that one day they were going to judge Israel. God was going to use them to judge Israel, and he didn't like that too much either. But uh, we see that, uh, but uh, so we have righteous Lot. That's why, again, if it doesn't matter what sin you've committed, if you're under the sound of the voice this morning, there's hope in the Lord. And his righteousness. But you got to come to him his way. You reason together with the Lord. Though your sins be a... God doesn't have any sin. You come to the Lord on his basis. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. God doesn't compromise. God doesn't say, uh, listen, you're such a good guy here, so I'm going to forgive you for this, and I'm not going to forgive. No, God either forgives you of everything or he forgives you of nothing. But he forgives you of everything. And there again, that, uh, that's, that uh, man that I heard a couple of weeks ago, I've, I've referenced him already, but uh, uh, he's, he's a, a bankruptcy. He, he pulled three uh, major companies in America out of, out of uh, bankruptcy. But he said... Um, when you go to court, the one thing, if you're going to declare bankruptcy, is you've got to declare that you have no possible way to pay. Now, that's bankruptcy. Now, when you come to the Lord, what do you have to say? I have no possible, hey, wait a minute, my good can outweigh my bad. Uh, Simon, so I could buy certain, no, just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. You know, uh, I come to thee, Lord. I mean, you have to really, and another, I like the other example I like to, is we learn 
uh, Casablanca, the great, uh, whenever the Stalin and Roosevelt and all, Roosevelt was a, was a scoundrel in a lot of ways, but he, was, he understood one thing, and that is, just like uh, uh, Grant did back in the Civil War, total surrender. You've got to take away their will to fight. And until you do that, you don't really have victory. The reason we had World War II is because we had World War I and they had an armistice rather than total. And so you had a whole country and a whole side of Europe that was still mad about a war and it didn't take anybody but uh, it'll take someone but with a lot of anger to stir up those people for a bigger war to start. Well, when we come to the Lord, it's unconditional surrender. It's, I cannot do anything. I'm at your total mercy. And that's why they call U.S. Grant, they called him Unconditional Surrender Grant. Uh, he, they would try to negotiate with him. He said, no, until you lay down your arms, we won't talk. And uh, when he did that, he, uh, they, they were amazed at what he did for them once. I mean, hey, he's treating us better than if, if we, you know, uh, they, uh, it was just amazing what he did for uh, the South when they, then that's what old uh, Sherman, he marched through Georgia and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he said, I'll give them my last cracker if they surrender, but I'll burn everything they have if they don't, you know. And what does the Lord say? Hey, listen, you're going to hell unless you surrender. And so it's unconditional surrender. And so uh, we see that uh, Lot had problems. And then we see that uh, he says that for the righteous, uh, he says, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing the law, their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Now, if God can deliver Lot, then he can deliver, deliver, deliver you. Now, unfortunately, Lot paid a price with his family. But one day, I guess I'll see Lot in heaven. Uh, that's the hope, isn't it? Is it? I mean, I hope I'll see Mrs. Lot in heaven too. You know, then what about her? Will I see her girl, his girls in heaven? I hope. You know, that's all we have is hope. Uh, that's why whenever uh, someone, you know, that's been, you know, I've preached funerals here since I've been here and people that uh, haven't been here in 30 years. And I hate it whenever someone walks up to me and says, Pastor, do you think I'll see my loved one in heaven? And the one, all I can say to them is, I hope so. Amen? Okay. Oh, there, boy. I, I'm not going to be like, uh, I like old J. Vernon McGee. I love that. Uh, he was an old, he was from, uh, he was a radio preacher for years. My, uh, when my kid was small, they thought he was saying, Dad, J. Bird McGee is on. J. Bird McGee. I know it was J. Vernon McGee. But uh, we listened to J. Vernon McGee. But uh, one of his illustrations was a preacher, kind of a poor preacher, uh, and he needed some money. But, uh, guy, but uh, the, the town scoundrel died. And everybody knew that he was just a wretched old guy. And, uh, oh, um, but his brother came up to him and said to the preacher, and said, um, you know, you know, we all know that my brother was a was a bad guy. But I would, I'll, you know, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you tell everybody that he was a good man. And uh, he said, oh man, I need that hundred bucks. So, but okay, I'll make the deal. And so the guy again, but it really bothered him that he made the deal. So he got up there and he said, I want you to know that old John Doe was just one of the meanest guys in all the world. And he was a, one of the meanest guys in this town. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. And so, <laughs> so, so he got his hundred bucks, I guess. But, uh, you know, uh, but uh, no, we're all dirty, rotten sinners that are saved by the same blood. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, he's the one who can cleanse us from the deepest stains. And aren't you glad of that? And so, but the thing about it is we can't, we can't compromise with sin. And we can't say that, oh, listen, uh, um, the Bible, you know, and I won't get into the social issues today, but th name them. 
But you know, the Bible justifies adultery or whatever. No, it doesn't justify any of that. And like I said, we take care of all the perversions, take care of all that, uh, that uh, the woke movement and everything else as far as the immorality by just saying, hey, listen, uh, one man, one woman, God made man, God made woman, and anything outside of marriage and physical relationships is sin. And so is that true? So that takes care of it all. And so you don't compromise with it. You don't, uh, uh, well, we've got to, we got to play, we got to accept these people. Yeah, we accept them as sinners just like we are. But their hope is in the Lord, not in that we accept them, but that God accepts them. And God doesn't accept any of us until we come to him unconditionally for salvation. Okay, we better close. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, help us to be strong in the, in the, in the word and loving in our application of it. Lord, may we give people hope, but we, may we not give them false hope. But may they see the bare necessities, Lord, of just knowing you and that unconditional surrender, that dying daily as a Christian that, uh, Lord, we must do, that uh, we reason with you, but you're the perfect standard. And anything that we do that is outside of that standard is, is sin. So, Lord, help us, Lord, to understand and to be conformed to your will. That's what you predestined us to be, Lord, is conformed to, to, to you. So help us, Lord, to live for you and to live uncompromisingly against sin. And Lord, whenever we sin, give us the, uh, a conscience that is, that is easy to be pricked, a conscience that is easy to be dealt with, and, and uh, th that we keep short accounts of our sins before you. Bless us, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.